to me in the womb, the baby's body is breathing with the internal dynamics and external dynamics of holographic breathing. The birth proce process is a activation of holographic breathing and a simulation of holographic breathing. Breastfeeding is an activation of those internal movements of holographic breathing. Every cell breathes with holographic breathing. It is shown in the movements of every fish, every animal, different organisms. It's there as a fundamental of life. So it's as old, it's new in a way in that us as humans haven't been doing it consciously up until now, presumably. But it is as old as life itself because it's there in our DNA and every cell. And also, you know, not too long ago, a mother told me that her newborn baby was doing holographic breathing. <laughs> so, in some ways, it hasn't been taught before, but babies just can do it naturally. So, it's kind of both ways. Now, when we normally breathe, and when we're breathing properly through our nose, we're activating the nose, we're activating the sinuses and nasal passageways, and these are a reflection of the chest and lungs. I don't have the picture on me, but normally I can show a picture showing the inside of the face and how it is a, that this area is a reflection of the lungs and your mouth is a reflection of the abdomen and the eyes are more to do with the brain. And with the nose and the sinuses and the nasal passageways, they can expand in all directions. Because there is an external connection to the air outside, so it can fill up like a balloon and empty like a balloon because it's got air coming in and out of it. And the same with the lungs. They can expand in all directions because there's a tube of air coming into them. If that tube of air was blocked, the lungs could not expand in all directions as they do. But the abdomen, it's like a balloon, we feel the expansion to the front and the sides, but what is causing that, this is the abdomen, the top, the diaphragm is dropping at the bottom. The bottom diaphragm is either lifting or holding and it's pulling together. It's a physical effort. It's pulling together and we feel the expansion forwards and we feel the expansion to the sides as if we are doing that expansion. But we're not doing that expansion. We're doing a contraction top to bottom that is causing that expansion in the brain. The brain will stay the same volume so it can't expand in all directions. For the brain to breathe contracts in one way and that causes an expansion in the other directions. For the arms, for the legs, for the pelvis, for the organs, they stay the same volume. So for them to breathe, they contract in one way, which causes an expansion in the other ways. So the, the brain, for it to breathe, contracts in one way, expands in another. For the cranium to breathe, it actually moves in lots of different directions, but it's a general contraction and expansion. And we don't do the expansion. It's not like the air comes into the chest and the chest is blown up because of the pressure of the air. And we can't make 
something expand the muscles the effort of the breath is a contraction the muscles contract in the chest to cause an expansion the muscles between the ribs and rising up into the spine and up into the jaw and up into the cranium they contract which lifts the ribs which causes more space inside the muscles of the diaphragm contract to pull the diaphragm down and the same in the pelvic floor to cause the expansion the muscles through the whole body through the face around the cranium contract in different ways to cause an expansion in one direction well to cause a contraction in one direction and then that contraction through a sequence of different procedures as shown with the balloon causes an expansion in another direction the baby in the womb after it gets to a certain size there's less and less fluid this is now a womb this balloon comes in very handy for showing all sorts of things now I, when I'm teaching mothers quite often they don't want to breathe deeply because it's or I'm, I'm intruding on the baby but if the mothers breathe with their diaphragm on the in-breath because after a stage the uterus is right up against the diaphragm and settled right down into the pelvis so as the mother's breathing the uterus is doing this breathing in breathing out breathing in breathing out the baby's head before it's engaged is at the top and the feet at the bottom breathing in the baby's shortening top to bottom expanding sideways breathing out the baby's lengthening and narrowing because the womb and the baby are going to stay the same volume so by the mother breathing she is e enacting that breath into the baby breathing in the baby will shorten and widen breathing out the baby will lengthen and narrow then the baby engages it turns the other way up its head's engaged in the pelvis so not only is there the breathing in and the breathing out enacting this motion of the breath into the baby then you get the contractions on top of that so it's breathing in, breathing out, breathing in. And then on top of that, big, big, deep breathing in. As the contraction comes, the baby shortens top to bottom strongly. And between the contractions, it's still small breathing in and out, but it lengthens. The baby lengthens and narrows. Contraction, the baby contracts and expand sideways it's imprinting the breath into the baby now my perception of it and when I've taught, taught it that movement is already in every cell of the baby right back to one cell two cells four cells eight cells sixteen cells within every cell there's the movement of the breath, breathing in, breathing out. Whether it can take in air or not doesn't matter. For a cell to move, for an amoeba to swim, the movement of the breath, muscles will only contract and relax. Contraction causes an expansion relaxation causes a narrowing so that is how every cell breathes and that's how every cell in the baby is breathing and then as it gets larger not only is it doing that movement within itself that movement is energetically connected to the universe the initial matrix of what we are forming around 
is physically based in that movement, the movement of every cell, gets large enough to engage with the diaphragm and then it's being printed not only in its cells but from the mother's breath. This is one of, maybe one of the reasons that people breathe more slowly with holographic breathing because the babe because the mother is bigger and the baby is much smaller to the mother this breathing in breathing out might take 5 seconds but because the baby is so small relatively to the baby that feels more like 20 seconds breath you know the smaller something is the faster their breath is like a a gnat his breath is really fast or a or a, 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 a hummingbird, its breath is really fast. In something big, the speed of the breath is proportional to their size, like an elephant. Its breath is really slow. So compared to the mother, the baby is small, so it might see it normal breath to a mother. It's a sl long, slow breath to the baby. So in a way holographic breathing takes you into this much slower breath when it relates to the baby in the womb and that you know it's happening in its cells but then it's initiated into the baby from the diaphragm then it's strongly initiated through birth and when I teach mothers holographic breathing with birth they have no pain or they have next to no pain they say they only have you lose 70 percent of the pain or it just is not painful at all because instead of fighting against the pain or against what is happening they're right in there with the baby breathing in breathing out breathing in breathing out so they're allowing the breath to be imprinted in the baby they're allowing their body to imprint it's not something to fight against something that is totally engaged in the fundamentals of the universe and orgasm. And then when the baby is finally comes earthside and is born, the first thing it does, well it first thing it breathes some air, it has its first breath, but then or even before that it comes on the nipple. And it's doing holographic breathing. Breastfeeding is a subtle form of holographic breathing. And then this mother's telling me her baby's doing holographic breathing <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so it may not have been taught before. And in that way, you know, that probably makes it the only new form of breath work for two or three thousand years. But in another thing, babies are already doing it. <laughs> It is there in birth, it is there in the womb, it is there in breastfeeding, it is there in every type of movement. That is why the Qi Kungs are so important, because I'm teaching how that movement engages into movement. So, but, it is often painful. See, I don't normally teach this. We started teaching it, but it was putting people into so much discomfort. We moved from that to teaching the energies of holographic breathing, where we're not engaging in that movement. And it's nice and feels really easy when you're breathing with this sideways motion of the breath. But when we engage this shortening of the breath, which is a contraction. I think if people were just doing it naturally as their body wanted to do it, it would just feel wonderful and blissful. But because in a way we're doing it, when I'm describing it, people are doing it, it can be a little bit forceful. And also, on top of that, because we are for some reason manifestly more engaged in the in-breath than the out-breath, whether that's to do with our society, our upbringing, 
whatever whatever reason that's doing that brings people more into the in-breath which is the contraction rather than the lengthening on the out-breath and it can start thinking ouch ouch that hurts in my bones because all the bones are getting pressed and different things but also what I've found with this it's very important for people to be aware of how the brain is breathing because automatically it's not just that the bones of the cranium are moving with the muscles causing the cranium to breathe causing the brain to breathe within the brain the brain is moving in that way with the breath initially this connects us to the astrocyte cells of the brain which are the connective tissue and before scientists thought these were just roughage debris <laughs> they were just connective tissue when Einstein died without actually asking they opened his head because they thought they were going to find loads more neural connections or more neurons that made him think better he didn't have any more neurons than anybody else did but he had hugely more astrocyte cells which they just thought didn't do anything they just held the brain in its shape and then that changed the whole of neural science they started investigating the astrocyte cells and neurons are like landline telephone lines they go physically in line but a astrocyte cell here can communicate directly with another astrocyte cell here and they have no idea how that communication is happening somehow it's going through the cranial fluid or the ether but it's more like how cell cell phones work that they can connect and there's something like 20,000 times more communication through the astrocyte cells and there is an intelligence to the astrocyte cells but it's not the intellect so when we start breathing with the astrocyte cells we're breathing with an area of our brain that doesn't think and I think that is one of the reasons people pass out cold with holographic breathing also when they're connecting to the channel behind holographic breathing because it changes us from our normal intellectual place to a part of our intelligence that isn't thinking and a part of our intelligence that is alive and well in a baby before its intellect has started forming and in this picture that I've kindly painted for you <laughs> these anemone type cells see they've got lots and lots of tentacles they are the astrocyte cells this is a, a neuron this is the body of the neuron that's the axon there's some myelinating glial cells but these they are the connective tissue they hold and it's all in fluid the brain is 90 percent fluid and the fluid is 99 percent water it's a aqueous place it's not a solid thing the cells aren't connected directly all the cells are joined by tentacles so it's like seaweed in the sea and is moving so these connective astrocyte cells what it feels like they're doing it's like those all those tentacles are contracting in one direction and it's causing the whole brain to contract in one direction and the whole brain to lengthen in the other direction so not only is the cranium breathing in a particular way but the brain is breathing in exact synchronicity to that and all of the astrocyte cells are contracting in one direction that's causing the brain to contract in one direction and lengthen in another 
Now we haven't breathed like that since we were born, since we stopped doing holographic breathing. So this brings something to the table that is new. And my experience of it, because I'm just doing holographic breathing all the time, so when I start investigating something, I'm like, I can't stop looking at it. And, you know, I've been doing holographic breathing a long time, but when I investigate this particular thing, and it just keeps going, it feels a bit like a piano has been dropped on my head. It really hurts. So this may be uncomfortable for people certainly if you practice it a lot i'm gonna go about you know we're not going to do it for a huge amount of time so hopefully it will be okay but i think now has it feels it's just coming up more and more that now is coming the time to engage that principle and um, oh, hi, glad you made it, great, I'm really pleased you're here. So now is, seems to be the time to engage that principle. For the newcomers, you're jumping in the deep end, so it's really worth to get the recordings when I send them afterwards and actually practice a bit. You know, I've been teaching this ongoingly for four years now, two years to groups in person, then another two years online. And we haven't, we haven't gone over anything. You know, we do a webinar four times and then that's it, we're on again. And we actually haven't repeated a single webinar in four years. So a lot of people here have gone through a lot of material. So if, if you're new, do, you know, I try and make it accessible for everybody, but spend time to go over it and practice the uh, recordings. As, as many people say, when they practice them, each time it brings up something new. And one of the reasons behind that is the channel. There's an intelligence that comes through. Sorry, I've got a bit of a runny nose. And the other reason is we're dealing with principles. I'm dealing with principles or teaching principles. And with a principle, you can go into it deeper and deeper and deeper forever. And it will just keep unfolding things about yourself. And in that, this we're not doing a technique and imprinting it on the body. We are taking a natural movement and energies in the body and allowing those to unfold. I watch them, I allow them to unfold, I work out or try to perceive as best I can what's happening and then I try and find an easy way of teaching that to people so they can also inquire into it within themselves and let it unfold within themselves. So it's not like I'm teaching a technique and do this. I'm showing something that's unfolded in me and inviting you to let it unfold in yourselves. So it's not intrusive. It's not like I'm laying something down on top of you. It's totally the opposite. I'm inviting you to come on an inquiry into your own body and energies. And this up-down motion, one, it's also uncomfortable. I've got these headphones on, there's absolutely no reason for it. Let's take those off. Um, I forgot what I was saying. The contraction of the breath is a lot to do with the hara. It's very physical. So in a way, what we've been doing, just going with the energy, has been really nice because it's like, oh, loads of energy, that feels great. But with this vertical contraction that I've been avoiding teaching for so long, it can feel very grounded and quite hard to be with. And 
it is a lot enacted through what is happening in our mouths when we're doing holographic breathing in the nose and sinuses these can expand and contract in all manner of ways because the air is it flowing into them but with holographic breathing the tongue on the roof of the mouth now it doesn't work with the tip of the tongue on the roof of the mouth but if you have the flat of the tongue on the roof of the mouth and more and more of it goes onto the roof of the mouth this seals the back of the mouth so no air is coming in from the throat the lips being closed no air is coming from so the mouth becomes a sealed unit it's dropping the jaw is dropping so there's an expansion that way there's also as we talk an expansion to the sides and what is produced in the whole face is a contraction back to the TMJ so there's expansion to the sides and expansion up and down but there's also a contraction back now we're not actually working with that there and I don't want people to work with that I'm just describing what's happening in the mouth there's a contraction and an expansion in different directions all caused by the muscles contracting and so the contraction through the body is very strongly enacted from the mouth the sinuses and nasal passageways much more this sideways much freer the movement in the eyes is much smaller it's to do with the intellect it's much finer but that also is this contraction in one way and an expansion in another way so the up down motion is enacted by the mouth and has this physical quality now we will go in and out of that and i will keep mixing it with the energies but while we're doing it and i'll keep bringing you you have to become aware of your brain and feel your brain breathing from the inside because otherwise it's kind of trying to do that but you're not allowing it or it's just because it's not in your mind it's not happening so there's something that going on that's out of your awareness so this can really hurt your brain later but if you allow it to breathe from the inside suddenly your brain is breathing in the same way as a baby's brain would breathe and it will become more supple and become softer and through all the nerves and like for me my nervous system is 63 years old so it's been static for a long time and breathed like that for a long time so once it does start breathing you know in but it might feel nice at the time but in between times like ow, ooh, ow this is hurting as it's because it's like never done aerobics before and you do an aerobic session and you're hurting afterwards it's like that but through the brain and the cells so we are you know i'm prepping this because we're kind of going down a new route and i'm sure this will evolve as we go along so in a way you're the guinea pigs <laughs> later later people you have to do all of the work so i can see what mistakes i make <laughs> i can teach it more fluidly but on the other hand you are the people or we are the people because i'm receiving it as well i'm walking along not really 100 percent knowing what i'm doing you know you're receiving the first transition of that particular thing which in its raw form is a nice thing to receive and it may not come out in a balanced and refined way but there's something about that first opening the door that's quite special <laughs>